I want to give a big thank you to all our sponsors. We couldn't do this without you. And a special thank you to our gold and silver sponsors, Chatton Brown, Carson's and Mintier LLP, National Wildlife Federation, Sage Sweetwood, and Shoot Mahali and Weinberger LLP. Okay, let's get going on our first session here, creating uh, pass, paths from dams to aquifers. I want to thank and introduce the moderator, Roger Dickinson, retired assembly member. Although with all the work that I think you do, Roger, I don't know how retired you are there. <laughs> Legislative director there and policy director at Civic Wells. So thank you very much, Roger, for moderating today. And it's all yours. Well, thank you, Howard. And uh, good morning to, to all of you who have joined us. Uh, I'm happy to be back uh, after having moderated a panel last year. And uh, despite a diminishing, steadily diminishing number of requests, uh, here I am again uh, this year. Um, we have uh, a all-star panel uh, this morning for a subject which is emerging uh, as increasingly uh, important, one might even say critical, with respect to how we are managing water in times of climate change with uh, increased uh, rainfall, reduced snow, potentially despite what we're seeing the, this year, uh, diminishing uh, and overdrafting, continuing of, of groundwater uh, and surface water supplies, uh, certainly uh, uh, very, very valuable uh, all over the, the state from north, north to south. So um, we're gonna jump right into uh, our panelists. I'm gonna uh, briefly introduce uh, all four of them. I'll let you know. There's more information uh, about them on the on the website. Uh, if you would, if you would like uh, some further uh, elaboration uh, on all their exploits, but let's talk about each one of them in turn, and then we'll uh, get to the presentations. Um, first, I want to introduce Julie Rentner, who is the uh, president of River Partners. River Partners uh, has for over 20 years successfully worked with farmers and other partners to restore 18,000 acres of floodplains in order to prevent flooding, rebuild natural habitat, store carbon, uh, increase groundwater recharge and support productive farmland. She received her Bachelor of Science in Forestry from UC Berkeley in 2002, go Bears, uh, and a master's degree in natural resources and environmental management from the University of Hawaii uh, in 2005, mahalo. Uh, and Julie uh, became president of River Partners in, in uh, 2020. Uh, we have uh, A.J. Goyal from the uh, Department of uh, Water Resources. He's the manager of statewide infrastructure investigations branch for DWR. And over the past 30 years, uh, A.J. has worked in planning, design, uh, and construction of many large water resource resources projects. Uh, currently under the FloodMar program, uh, AJ is leading the climate vulnerability analyses and ad adaptation planning for Merced River uh, watershed, the Stanislaus River watershed, the Tuolumne River watershed, the Calaveras River watershed, and the Upper San Joaquin River uh, watershed. Uh, AJ holds a bachelor's degree in civil engineering and a master's degree in structural engineering. Uh, he's a licensed civil and structural uh, engineer. Um, we also have with us from the Department of, of Water Resources, uh, Kamyar Guvechi. I apologize, Kamyar, if I didn't quite nail that, but uh, he is the manager of DWR's Division of Planning, where he works with numerous government agencies, California Native American tribes, uh, other stakeholders, and the public to prepare the California Water Plan uh, update. And uh, finally, we're lucky to have Matt Zidar, uh, the Water Resources Manager for the San Joaquin uh, County uh, Public Works Department. Uh, Matt has engaged in water and groundwater resources planning, management, and engineering for over 30 years uh, and uh, is currently Water Resources Manager for San Joaquin County. Uh, Matt has worked in the public sector as a manager of water uh, uh, management division uh, at the Monterey County Water Resources Agency, and uh, is uh, and a uh, has has been a, had a senior leadership roles, I should say, uh, at a number of private sector firms. So, uh, as you can tell from that very brief description, uh, we've got uh, a, a great amount of resource here with us this morning to discuss this <laughs> subject. And, and with that, I'm going to hand it off to Julie. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Roger. Thank you, Howard. Thank you, everybody, for being here this morning. This is um, 
you know, one of the most important topics California is facing, right, is how on earth do we harness what the climate scientists are projecting will be more intense rainfall, um, a much more periodically falling on our state than we've experienced in the past. How do we quickly modify our water system so that we can optimize the way our weather patterns are changing um, for the benefit of our economy, our populations, our environmental quality, our public health, and our ecosystems? So um, I have some slides to share with you today. I have this awesome, I'm really lucky to have this role in this community, which is that I get to be on the ground, boots in the dirt, figuring out how to do um, work on the landscape that helps us manage our water in more effective and efficient ways. Um, I specifically get to work in the agricultural communities of the Central Valley, um, finding those opportunities where we can um, expand our floodways and our river corridors in a way that allows water to spread out, slow down and sink in, and also benefits um, ecosystems, uh, recreational opportunities, communities, et cetera. So what I'm gonna present to you today, all the slides are from kind of experience on the ground um, from farmers really figuring out how this all works. Um, and I'm so excited um, to have uh, planners and engineers here to help you with more of the, the gritty details uh, that, that subtends and backs up some of the experiences I'm going to share with you. Um, so um, let me share some slides with you. <coughs> Put that into presentation. Now. Roger did a great introduction, but I just wanted to make sure to show you guys River Partners as a 501c3. This is the extent of where we work in California. So really focused in the Central Valley, although we do work in other watersheds and we think about our outcomes in, in all of those different ways Roger's talked about. Um, and if you were out looking at a River Partners restoration project when it's underway, you might feel like you're looking at somebody establishing an orchard, uh, except instead of establishing walnuts or almonds, we're establishing cottonwoods, willows, and valley oak forests across the valley. Um, so, you know, this session is about how do we make better connections between the, the dams and the aquifers, how do we get water in? And the real, you know, conundrum that California is facing is the extremes. We're gonna, we're, we're facing more extreme flood events. The climate projections show that uh, flood flows out at Vernalis in 50 years time will probably be somewhere between two and five times higher than the flood of record. Um, that's that's devastating. Um, and it it will lead to you know damages and, and loss of life that is, is greater than anything we've experienced in the flood community today. Um, and it also represents a really tremendous opportunity <laughs> for California if we can mobilize fast enough um, to refill what we've mined out of, out of the aquifers below our feet. And that not only supports people who live in the valley, communities, businesses, and farms in the valley, but it also helps our entire water system, everybody who relies on those deliveries across the state um, to weather those longer periods of drought that we expect around the horizon as well. So um, what happens, you know, when we get into long droughts or when we get into long floods, people get real excited, right? In the, in the midst of the long drought, we hear a lot about what's happening with our, um, uh, you know, ability to continue irrigating farmland and the most productive farm, you know, industrial complex on planet Earth, <laughs> um, as well as what happens to, you know, the quality of the water, both in the surface and below ground that people and wildlife depend upon. And it gets, you know, real... Um, Real folks get real nervous real fast and start to find um, an op, you know opportunities to do emergency response investments, just like post flood, you know, which we saw in this last year, and um, and start to think about how we can do how how we can plan more long range sustainability um, plans. Um, <laughs> unfortunately, the the climate uh, is changing so rapidly that we don't have time to you know. Um, both simultaneously deliver all of these real emergency actions that are necessary and be you know, preparing for the big investments we need to make to be sustainable into the long run. So we have to find ways to do them both simultaneously and get as much progress as we can on longer term solutions um, while we're dealing with the emergency response. This is a big challenge for California. It's gonna take a lot more funding than we've ever put to you know, these, these challenges before. So, <clears throat> I come from a wildlife organization, right? My logo is a bird. <laughs> our organization was founded to try to create wildlife habitat that benefits people in the environment. That's our mission. And so when we think about the Central Valley and what it once looked like, this is a, 
uh, an image for, of, you know, kind of a pre-settlement expectations of what um, uh, aquatic and riparian habitats look like across the valley. We've lost 98% of these, right? Today, the valley is almost all of these um, areas have been leveled and drained and are farmed. Uh, but they, rep you know, this, this map kind of represents what we might think about as opportunities to put water back in the ground in really big gulps. So to us, you know, these areas represent migration pathways, trade routes uh, for, for people who lived here before the cold rush, um, microclimate refugia for wildlife moving across the state. There's the abundance and diversity of our ecology that supports our entire agricultural industry. But there's also this beautiful overlay, and I'll talk a little bit more about this data in a minute, but this is a map from um, DWR's recent um, aerial EM imaging of the subsurface of the valley, right? So helicopter flew these transects that are maybe three or more miles apart up and down the valley, shooting electromagnetic signals into the ground, and then um, the, the signals as they return, translating them through an algorithm to try to understand the resistivity of the subsurface. So where are the places where water can percolate into the ground quickly, and where are the places where water might be slower to percolate into the ground? And this is really new stuff. This was just released, I think, last month, right? Um, and, uh, you know, I think everybody across the valley is still trying to, in, you know, uh, interpret what they're going to use this data for and how it's going to change the way we plan um, work across the valley. Um, to me, as somebody who cares about rivers and restoration and floodplains, I see this as a blueprint. I mean, this is this is the very rough um, beginnings of a plan of where are those most high priority places that we can work on spreading this water out across the landscape and having an expectation that it's going to sink in and help people. Uh, this data also helps us understand the interconnectedness of those below ground um, storage areas, right? Um, as kind of um, counter to the kind of political boundaries that we've created in Sigma around GSAs. Um, so super helpful. And I'm, I'm hopeful that the next few years will give us a lot more uh, detailed understanding about how to use our aquifers to the benefit of us all. So this is the fun stuff I get to work on. When I talk about floodplain expansion, what does it really look like? Um, and on the right here, you see a map of the middle part of the San Joaquin River, mainly Stanislaus County. The red lines are the flood control levees and the yellow areas are the floodplains of the San Joaquin River that have been disconnected from overbank events by those levees. So you can see that the floodplain of the San Joaquin River is somewhat constrained. It's not, you know, it's not, the floodwater doesn't expand across the entire, you know, the Central Valley here. We're talking about, you know, four to eight miles wide flood corridor along the edges of the San Joaquin River that in years past, uh, we had different value sets. We built levees to try to drain off um, and disconnect those areas from overbank flooding and damages associated with it. But what that system has done is really concentrated flows at the um, communities downstream of this area, like what Matt's going to talk about. And it actually exacerbates flood stages and the intensity of flooding downstream. So for a while, we've been working on this very simple exercise, takes a long time to do it, of breaching those levees in ways that are um, beneficial um, to altered land use behind the levees. Sometimes breaching a levee and allowing water to flood across the, the natural floodplain requires setback levees. Sometimes it doesn't, just kind of depends on the topography and the landscape. Um, and, you know, this is super simple. It's a backhoe digging a hole through a levee, right? How can that possibly take 20, 30 years to get the permission to do. Um, but in this case, uh, and across the Central Valley, we have a really long history of federal, state, and local involvement in how the flood system was constructed, is managed, and it takes a while to get through the whole process. So the levee breach that you're looking at here um, was actually authorized and permitted in 1997, wasn't installed until 2017, and I'm excited to report that in two weeks' time, the final bit of paperwork will be completed for this project. So 25 years after the floods, we're finally able to um, breach that levee and reconnect that floodplain. So this kind of underscores just how quickly we have to act right now on big solutions um, if we're going to be ready for, you know, the, the changing climate and the pace of that changing climate. Um, you know, uh, I don't know if, if if people here track this as closely as I do, but the Central Valley and San Joaquin Valley in particular 
um, has experienced local extirpation of almost all of its native wildlife. Um, and what we've learned through 20 years working in restoration of wildlife habitats is that when you build the appropriate habitat, they move back in. It's wild. So this big long list of species that are locally extirpated or on the brink of extinction in the San Joaquin Valley, almost all of them we've seen have um, really tangible population level results as a as a outcome of restoring habitat in appropriate places for them. So there's a lot of hope here that finding ways to put water back in the ground also benefits, you know, the recovery of our ecosystems that are all on the brink of completely lost. Um, I've had the pleasure of working on flood planning for a while, as you could tell from some of the stories I just shared. Um, but, um, you know, the flood planning world kind of lends a few examples of helpful collaboration and state and local partnership that will probably help us in connecting dams and aquifers. Um, I got to participate in regional flood planning. So in 2006 or seven, the state invested a whole bunch of money in flood planning that we worked through creating the Central Valley Flood Protection Plan. One of the cool um, structures that was put in place at the beginning of that was to create regional flood plans. So to invite regional leadership to create a coalition of stakeholders who then articulate what their flood risks are, what their flood damages look like, what the opportunities look like, the projects list, you know, on this website is huge, what their opportunities look like to improve their flood safety, and then share that with the state. The state looks at those lists and identifies things that they can invest in based on authorities and available dollars. I think, um, you know, we've been interested for a long time in figuring out how to marry this regional and Central Valley wide flood planning effort, which is pretty inclusive and, and really helpful um, for bringing everybody onto the same page, how to marry it with our SIGMA institutions and our groundwater sustainability agencies and the incredible work that DWR is doing, you know, valley wide. Um, so in our neck of the woods, we also found this incredible overlap between where there's potential to expand flood plains in the Central Valley that benefit groundwater recharge, flood safety, and wildlife, and long-term land managers, right? So in the left-hand side here, you see that the San Joaquin River National Wildlife Refuge has been, the boundary has expanded all the way down the river. This is an, a, a boundary that simply allows the Fish and Wildlife Service to engage with landowners in managing properties through easements or through fee title transactions. And what this represents is a, an amazing alignment between the Fish and Wildlife Service, which has authorities in wildlife habitat restoration and, and management, endangered species recovery, with <laughs> the, the structures that are in place that manage floodwaters and presumably some aquifer recharge as well. So I'm excited to you know, share with you all that we're in. in the Central Valley or in the San Joaquin Valley um, upstream of the Delta, there is a really strong understanding between federal and state institutions about the connection between land management and um, changing the way our rivers are managed so that they benefit both flood safety and aquifer recharge. This is what it looks like on the ground. So this is an expanded flood corridor where levees on both sides of the San Joaquin River, which is meandering through the photo, levees on both sides have been modified to allow for floodplain inundation at much greater, um, more frequent um, intervals and at greater magnitudes than ever before. On the left-hand side, the floodplain has been reforested. So everything that you see on the left-hand side of this image is native cottonwood and, and valley oak forests contributing, you know, a percent or two towards what, you know, historically was, was in the bottom of the valley and supporting the recovery of a bunch of endangered species, birds and mammals in particular. Um, and on the right is a uh, farm field, you know, that's continued to be farmed in, in the floodway. Um, the, the, the difference between these two sides of the rivers in terms of management and flood damages is that on the left-hand side, when the river gets high and the water spreads out, it's a benefit um, to the land use there. It really helps rejuvenate the forest and the habitat quality. When the river gets high on the, on the right-hand side of this image, it causes some property damages and it's pretty expensive to clean up. Um, so we work in the space of finding the mosaic of where can you have habitat areas that are rejuvenated by overbank flooding, where can you have farms that aren't damaged by overbank flooding, and how can you make a, a wider flood corridor that, that balances all of these human values? Um, you know, the question about where you, where you can do this is a really important one, and um, it's informed by all kinds of different experiences over the, over the years. The 1997 flood in the San Joaquin Valley reached the levee systems in 17 different places. Uh, floodwaters were 10 feet deep in some places and really, you know, some pretty damaging um, outcomes. And um, 
I'm excited to report that the third update of the Central Valley Flood Protection Plan actually highlights now the expanded flood corridors of the San Joaquin River as um, at one of the major elements of providing flood safety for the Central Valley. So this is an image of a restored uh, floodplain where the red circle is on the map here, which correlates with a spot where the flood system was weak in 1997 and broke in many places anyways. So this is multi-benefit, you know, project work. When we think about how we overlay it with what we know about our aquifers, it's still a little bit un unknown. We definitely know that our rivers and our floodplains are connected to deeper storage, what we don't understand yet in great detail is the fate of that water. So as that flood water spreads across and soaks in, is it flowing east, west, just down? You know, where is it filling up and which groundwater wells are actually going to see benefit from it? From our um, experience on the ground, we know that there are groundwater wells miles away from the river whose levels seem to be directly influenced by the water levels in the river. And then we have wells really close by the river whose, whose water elevations maybe aren't linked at all to river levels. So we know there's complexity below ground in terms of the um, ability to convey water in and amongst coarse fractions and sand and gravels and clays. And we need to get better understanding that if we're going to really locate investments in this kind of flood floodplain reconnection work for the benefit of aquifer recharge. Um, and then real quickly, I just wanted to share with you a project example and a couple highlights um, about how this uh, can work. So this is one of the projects that we like to take folks on site tours. And please, if you would like to come visit the river and talk about floodplains, call me because we love to do tours out here. Um, <clears throat> but you can see this is where the Tuolumne River meets the San Joaquin River in Dos Rios Ranch, which has been identified as California's next new state park. Woohoo! <laughs> it hasn't transferred to state parks ownership yet, but it will pretty soon. Um, but it's a it's a property that River Partners has purchased and restored um, for multi-benefit floodplain reconnection and restoration. Um, it's a multi-benefit project, and we use this framing in the flood world quite a lot to describe when you can deliver both um, flood system improvements or flood risk reductions and ecosystem uh, benefits in one place. And I really hope that we start to use the same vernacular in the flood management or in the aquifer recharge world where we can deliver these multi-benefit projects that also have a significant contribution to the water balance um, of our groundwater basins. Um, but in this example project, you can see these two pie charts to show like how this is this this is public investment and work, right? We're talking about state, federal, and local dollars that all pile into one place to deliver a project that has a single project description, but multiple project outcomes. So if you look at the investment in this project by funding source, you can see the federal, local, private, and state breakdowns here, the state being the largest contributor of funding, but certainly the federal government contributing a lot as well. Or on the right-hand side, I really love thinking about this one, is the investment in this project by program focus area, right? So the different categories of investment being like flood focused programs, habitat focused programs, recreation focused programs. When you can um, find ways to partner these different um, interest groups or programs in one place, they all kind of inform one another as well. So instead of, you know, a very strict flood engineering analysis of the project saying this isn't, you know, this is the way that we would optimize flood risk, pr you know, protection here would be to uh, put a, you know, concrete slurry wall through the levee and then uh, habitat focused um, program saying, oh, well, the best way to optimize habitat would be to make sure that you have, you know, some incredible roughness in the floodway that's really hard for the flood engineers to absorb. Instead, when you bring program focuses into one project like this, you get give and take and you end up with a big, a large scale project. In this case, this is about 2,100 acres of floodplain that's been reconnected um, that delivers on multiple different program areas. So we feel there's great promise in this multi-benefit approach, even in aquifer recharge um, venues um, because the needs are great. I mean, we need to reconnect really somewhere in the order of 100,000 acres of floodplains in the San Joaquin Valley um, to really get at the groundwater recharge outcomes that we know are possible and probably required um, to make California both flood safe and to get us through the longer droughts that are coming. So with that, I'll stop um, and turn the, turn the um, presentation over to my friend Ajay at DWR, um, but it, we have a lot more um, information to share about all of this work and I look forward to questions um, when it's time. Thank you very much, Julie. I think Kamyar is going to start the presentation and I'm going to come in the middle. Kamyar. Yes, so I am, uh, good morning everyone. Uh, Kamyar Gavechi, Department of Water Resources. 
And I'm uh, now sharing my slide. Hopefully you can see it. Uh, Roger, can you see the cover slide? Looks good. Okay, great. Uh, so um, uh, Ajay and I will be co-presenting uh, this, uh, this uh, presentation. And uh, really our focus is going to be on state actions that uh, are and will help increase and accelerate multi-benefit uh, groundwater recharge and aquifer replenishment. Uh, before I jump in, I would like to uh, have a shout out to Judy Corbett, uh, Johnny Carlson, and Howard Penn, uh, as well as our moderator, Roger, uh, for helping us prepare for this, uh, this session. So uh, Julie did a great job of describing the extremes that California uh, water has and will continue to experience. Uh, we are now uh, observing more frequent and more consequential uh, extreme events. Uh, and a lot of those are, uh, a lot of that is being driven by climate change impacts uh, to our uh, climate and weather. Uh, this is a, a uh, graph of American river flows, both historic and simulated with climate change included. And what we see here and, and in many of our other uh, river studies is that there's a pronounced uh, shift uh, in the future uh, from our historic um, uh, water year cycle. So we're going to be experiencing higher and earlier peak flows uh, and lower summer flows. And uh, a lot of our um, water infrastructure was designed, constructed, and is operated based on the historic uh, real the historic uh, trends. But we really need to modernize and uh, update our uh, the way we uh, manage and uh, build our infrastructure, including um, the greater use of natural infrastructure. I, I put this slide up because Julie actually. Uh, 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 talked about this in that uh, there's a lot of systemic and institutional challenges that's making implementing uh, these projects uh, for groundwater recharge and aquifer replenishment uh, takes more time, more money. Uh, a lot of it's because we're very fragmented and decentralized in the way we manage water in California. And that also spills over into siloed uh, regulations that uh, are inconsistent, inflexible, and sometimes even conflicting with each other. Uh, our data is as siloed as our institutions are, which makes it very difficult to uh, have informed uh, it, in data analysis and, and decision support. Um, our funding is certainly insufficient, but also a boom and bust. And that makes it difficult to build and operate um, uh, the actions that we need, the projects that we need. And then more and more, the public is demanding that we uh, be able to demonstrate what's the return on investment that we get in, in, in uh, our water infrastructure uh, management. And then certainly there's uh, inequities in the way water management decisions uh, have been uh, and are made and how the benefits and impacts of projects are allocated. So really to go forward, you know, to have a more sustainable and resilient future, we need to get our uh, multiple water sectors to work better together. So this, uh, this water sector flower, uh, the, each petal uh, represents or illustrates each of our major water sectors. And historically, we tend to operate around the periphery where there's little or no overlap. To be more resilient and sustainable, we have to get our water sectors to work together toward the center of this flower where we get maximum overlap. And that's what we mean by integrated watershed management. And that's all about bringing, you know, having multi-sector collaboration, bringing multiple disciplines to bear and planning multi-benefit projects, and then getting the sectors to knit together their funding sources to actually get those projects implemented. So flood-managed aquifer recharge, or FLOODMAR for short, um, is, 
is really a great example of this integrated watershed management approach, especially when it's uh, uh, implemented at a watershed scale. And FloodMar is all about using floodwaters for managed aquifer recharge on agricultural lands, working lands, uh, and uh, natural lands. So um, FloodMar, uh, it benefits are um, realized most when we take a headwater to groundwater approach. And there's no one flood mar type of action. It's really a compilation uh, or integration of a number of activities. That includes upper watershed management in our forests uh, and upper watershed meadows. It includes using forecast informed reservoir operations so we can uh, anticipate when the storms are coming and be able to draw down our reservoirs um, in, uh, in advance to be able to capture more of those flood flows. But then as we release that water, uh, we want to have a way to um, capture that in new and expanded conveyance and recharge areas, including expanded bypasses and the floodplains that, uh, that Julie described. We also want to uh, use agricultural and working lands to spread those floodwaters and help recharge depleted aquifers. And to do that, we're going to need um, market mechanisms, uh, landowner compensation, uh, recharge credits, incentives to really engage uh, landowners uh, in this activity. And we can do it, this flood mar uh, approach in a way that actually helps improve terrestrial and aquatic ecosystems. So the state of California uh, since 2017 has acknowledged the importance of flood mar type activities. And most recently uh, in the governor's executive, drought executive order uh, about a year ago and the governor's water supply strategy. So the four major types of uh, at activities that the state is and can take to increase and fa fast track flood mar projects are first to, to really promote watershed studies and the convening of watershed networks to better understand our climate vulnerabilities and to really uh, understand what are the best adaptation projects that are multi-sector and multi-benefit. Another is to identify the prime recharge areas using the aquifer character using aquifer characterization like the AEM surveys that Julie mentioned. And that also includes getting a better understanding of where ancient paleo riverbeds are that are highly that have high infiltration uh, capacity. Another is to provide fiscal incentives and regulatory incentives so that we can get more project proponents working on aquifer replenishment projects, as well as repurposing land use. And then finally, uh, but not least, is to get the state of California to rec recognize aquifers as natural green infrastructure, having ecosystem services. And so what uh, for the rest of our presentation, Ajay and I are going to give you a little bit more in, uh, information about each one of these uh, activities. So I'm going to turn it over to you, Ajay. Thank you very much, Kamyar. Thank you all uh, for uh, taking the time to meet with us and listen to our, our, our the projects we are working on. So to better understand the impacts or vulnerabilities of climate change, we are DWR is conducting five watershed studies in the San Joaquin Valley. So one is the Calaveras River River Basin study, River water, Watershed Study Basin Watershed Study, then Stan, Stanislaus River Watershed Study, then Tuolumne River Watershed and Merced, and Upper San Joaquin River Watershed Study, which include Fresno River and Chowchilla River. And for each of these studies, we have partnered with federal agencies, regional, local agencies, specifically all uh, ground, all, all the irrigation districts and water districts uh, that, in, that are in each of those basins. 
and working with them, we are developing an uh, integrated set of tools ranging from headwaters to groundwater, upper watershed, reservoir operations, then flood operations, and then groundwater recharge, and then spreading water uh, models that allow us to spread water in, a, in an organized manner on, on lands um, and, and also managing ecosystem and such. So uh, then what we have done is uh, we are conducting the, uh, a state-of-the-art climate vulnerability analysis for each of these watersheds, five watersheds. And after that, uh, we are going to be looking at strategies uh, that will allow us to adapt to these, these changing conditions. Come um, here, oh, one more thing. And we are looking at multi-sector uh, here, uh, basically looking at flood management, ecosystem management, uh, water supply, uh, surface water store, uh, uh, storage, groundwater storage, all of these uh, these uh, benefit areas to see uh, how we could together um, and reduce the impacts and, and increase the benefits. So uh, the Merced River watershed study is further along, and we have completed the technical analysis for the for the uh, for the uh, for the study. And this, uh, for example, ranges, you can see the upper watershed, the one in, uh, in, in magenta color, and then the reservoir, and then we have creeks below modeled, and then after that, the groundwater basin. And um, so we are working in partnership with Mercer Irrigation District and several, actually several consultants, uh, including uh, one of our partner is uh, uh, Sustainable Conservation. Uh, next, please. So one interesting observation we made here is that the current river, Merced River, has a peak flow capacity of about 6,000 cubic feet per second. And we found that in, in about 50 years uh, from a uh, under changing climate, we could hit a peak flow of up to 42,000 CFS in Merced River. That's a 600% increase in peak flow. And the current river channel is not capable of handling such a flow. So with this concern, we started looking at what can we do to the reservoir operations or, or operations in general in the watershed to handle such a peak. And uh, I will show you in, in next few slides how we were able to bring, uh, you know, mitigate for this, for this, uh, for the high, high peaks. Come here next, please. So here you will see some of the findings of this climate analysis, kind of the climate vulnerability analysis we did. The results we are showing here are for a three degree increase in temperature and 10% increase in intensity of precipitation. And this is for year 2070, about 50 years from now. So I already mentioned about the 600% increase in peak flow. Then we are also noticing a 20% increase in over groundwater overdraft. A 9%, uh, uh, we will be seeing that about 9% fewer months uh, will have uh, depth of groundwater less than 30 foot, which is going to impact uh, groundwater dependent ecosystems. And then Lake McClure would have a reduction of about 9% in storage. And then uh, irrigation demand is going to increase by 7% because of uh, increase in temperature. Next, please. Then, uh, as far as the adaptation is concerned, we have identified actually three different ways to, to uh, reoperate the system. One is we did flood mar using flood waters to manage aquifer recharge, and wherein we've kept the ditches, the existing canals full of water and then took some water and spread on egg lands. By doing these two things, we found we could actually recharge in addition uh, about 60,000 acre feet per year, more than what's already being done. And then secondly, if we were to overlay to this forecast informed reservoir operations, then we would increase this to about 90,000 acre feet. And then if we were to aggressively operate the reservoir, wherein we would lower the storage in the reservoir in anticipation of floods coming in. 
uh, and then capture the flood flows. And then when you lower the reservoir, we'll send that water into groundwater storage. If you could do that kind of operation, it, we actually could even increase even more. And under this operation, we are able to bring down the peak, that 42,000 acre feet, the 42,000 CFS peak I showed you in the you know, previous slide. We could bring that peak down significantly to something in the order of like 8,000 CFS. So there is a way of, of bringing down these peaks, uh, peak flood, flood, flood peaks through reoperation, through connecting dams to aquifers. And then another thing is another interesting finding is that when we did the recharge in the Merced Basin, we found about half of the water that we had recharged moved to neighboring subbasins. Very interesting. Only one third stayed in the Merced Basin. And another interesting thing that happened is one sixth of the water came back into the streams and creeks, river, Mercer River and creeks. So which is very good for, for to create base flow for, eco, for aquatics, especially during dry flow or dry periods or during low flow conditions and summer fall months. So overall, we saw a breadth of benefits resulting from this by, by connecting reservoir operations to groundwater operations, which is subsidence mitigation, uh, improvement in habitat conditions for salmon and also for shorebirds and for GN, groundwater dependent ecosystems, more groundwater storage, the reduction in, you know, in, uh, in, uh, in overdraft. Um, we were able to bring groundwater storage up uh, and, uh, and many more benefits overall. I think this is my last slide come here, it looks like. So there is, we are learning a lot and the results for other four studies are going to be coming up, uh, coming out within next year and a half. So our anticipation is by June 2024, one and a half year from now, we will have results for all five studies available. So thank you very much. Yeah, Come thank here. you, Ajay. And uh, so I'm just repeating uh, this previous slide to note uh, that uh, Ajay just covered the watershed study work that the state is doing. and. Um, uh, of course, uh, the big footnote is when we run those watershed studies, we assume uh, all the water sectors are working together seamlessly and uh, all the uh, project uh, uh, permits and everything um, are in place so that we could implement those adaptation strategies to get those uh, outcomes. Uh, in reality, we're not quite there. So the other three um, actions that the state is working on is really trying to uh, bring uh, our human and institutional systems uh, uh, in a position to actually be able to realize the benefits that uh, and the potentials that are out there. So, um, so again, one of the things that DWR is undertaken is getting a better understanding of our groundwater aquifers uh, through characterization, through aerial uh, uh, um, surveys. Uh, there's also, you'll see that tractor is, uh, there, that's called the totem. That's the uh, uh, land version of the same technology, which can also get, uh, provide much more detailed information at a smaller spatial scale. And a, a lot of, there's a lot of practical applications uh, from uh, this AEM survey work. Um, some of the examples of how the AEM data are already being used is to improve the uh, groundwater models uh, and our ability to uh, conceptualize how aquifers uh, operate. Um, also, to give people a better understanding of where the prime recharge areas are on their land. Uh, so that they can make better decisions about how to uh, use their land for groundwater recharge and per potentially for uh, uh, land repurposing. Uh, we also uh, can use this information to get better understanding of groundwater quality and subsidence. Um, so another uh, way that the state can help is to help create markets for uh, flood mark 
public-private partnerships. So really to uh, incentivize multi-benefit recharge that can uh, concurrently reduce flood risk, replenish our aquifers, and restore, restore both terrestrial and aquatic ecosystems. One of the ways to do that is actually begin developing or building uh, environmental groundwater accounts, basically groundwater banks that are dedicated to improving um, uh, natural systems. Uh, one way that that could be done is uh, basically providing public funding to landowners to recharge water during high flow periods with the understanding that they would use that water during the dry periods rather than divert it uh, from the river or uh, uh, that, that can then leave more water in the river for uh, fish and aquatic habitat. Uh, also, uh, we recognize that uh, a, a significant amount of land in the Central Valley will need to be repurposed as part of Sigma implementation. So land that is currently irrigated, some of that will need to be uh, used for other purposes with lower um, a, a, a smaller water footprint. That could include crop rotation for healthy soils management, uh, dedicated recharge basins, actually setting aside easements for terrestrial uh, and uh, aquatic ecosystem restoration, and even solar farms, uh, which uh, I like to call solar mar because uh, solar farms could also uh, recharge water underneath during high flow periods. Uh, the governor's drought executive order that uh, was signed about almost a year ago, uh, set up, uh, actually directed state agencies, including the Department of Water Resources and the State Water Board to find ways to uh, expedite uh, groundwater recharge projects. And there are a number of projects that are eligible uh, to, uh, for under this program, uh, including uh, open lands and working lands and uh, actions that can help mitigate groundwater conditions uh, that have been caused by the drought. Uh, the actions can be taken by state agencies uh, and local agencies with DWR concurrence. And that concurrence is through a self-certification uh, uh, project uh, eligibility form that's online. Uh, and then once the project proponent submits it and DWR concurs, uh, that, that project can have a uh, CEQA suspension during the uh, period of the drought uh, executive order. Now we've learned, we're working with the Water Board, DWR, and uh, Department of Fish and Wildlife on these projects. Uh, we've actually gone through a 180-day temporary permit project for Mar Mariposa Creek uh, in the Merced River watershed. But we've got a lot more to learn and understand how we can further streamline the process so that when we get another series of storms like we did a few weeks ago, or we did uh, in December of 2021, we'll, we'll be ready as a state to get more, to put more of those floodwaters uh, under the ground. So the, the final way that uh, I'd like to share with you that the state um, can um, help expedite groundwater uh, recharge and aquifer replenishment is to begin thinking of aquifers as natural or green infrastructure. So our colleagues, uh, Lucian Filler and Francisco Guzman uh, did a research and looked up uh, all the public, re all the sections of the public resource code and the water code related to natural infrastructure. Um, and what we found was that in public resource code section 71154, there is a definition of natural infrastructure, and that is using natural ecological systems or processes uh, in a way that can help reduce vulnerability and increase adaptive capacity, and doing that by perpetuating or restoring their ecosystem services. Uh, it also goes on to um, say that 
natural infrastructure can include any form of aquatic or terrestrial vegetated open space. And it gives a list of examples of those. Uh, it also says that it could also be systems and practices that use or mimic natural processes, um, uh, like bioswales. Uh, what you'll notice there is there's really no mention of underground, and there's no examples uh, that would tend to suggest this includes aquifers. Uh, also, the the code goes on to say that all of this is intended to provide an array of benefits to people and wildlife. Uh, we also uh, often describe those as public benefits. So I think everyone would agree that uh, aquifers, particularly when they're healthy, provide us an array of ecosystem services uh, listed on the slide from water storage during wet times to water supply during drier times, treating and purifying water, attenuating flood flows, augmenting the base flows of rivers and streams and springs. Also uh, making sure that the land surface is maintained and preserving uh, groundwater dependent ecosystems. And I'd also like to note that that includes uh, ecosystems within the ground, both the soil, topsoil, as well as the aquifer. Uh, there are invertebrates and um, an array of uh, microscopic uh, organisms that actually help in providing those ecosystem services, particularly on the water quality uh, treatment side. Nutrient recycling and then the formation of healthy soils. So there's a lot of talk uh, and discussion about how we can do more groundwater recharge. What I'd like to uh, suggest or convey in this slide is that there, groundwater recharge is one of a number of strategies that can help replenish aquifers to health, and that is to restore their ecosystem services of aquifers. So certainly natural and managed groundwater recharge is right up there. However, by reducing water demand on an aquifer through uh, water use efficiency by agriculture and urban can help uh, restore those ecosystem services. By repurposing land use, which reduces the water footprint and also uh, improves the quality of water that infiltrates uh, into the land by remediating uh, groundwater quality through pretreatment, uh, taking uh, aquifers that are now saline or have nitrates or other contaminants and treating them to improve uh, their, uh, the quality of the groundwater. And then integrating surface and groundwater management and storing and banking the groundwater. And last but certainly not least, attenuating and retaining uh, floodwaters or flood mar. So I think we would all agree that these are very valuable services to uh, humans and uh, other uh, natural systems. So I think the time has come uh, for the state of California to recognize aquifers as natural infrastructure um, uh, alongside our forests, our floodplains, our wetlands, and uh, this would also set it up that we would begin uh, understanding that the replenishment um, of those aquifers is a public benefit that could also be eligible uh, for public funding. So actions that replenish overdrafted, degraded aquifers, that's groundwater recharge, but all those other actions as well, should be eligible to receive state technical assistance, uh, agency regulatory alignment, uh, and or public funding. And then just to, again, reemphasize that actions that replenish aquifers are scalable and the benefits increase with spatial scale going from a parcel 
all the way to a watershed scale, um, through greater water sector collaboration, through stronger agency and institutional alignment, and by getting folks to knit together multiple funding sources. And with that, uh, I will turn, I will stop sharing and turn it over to Matt. Trying to get my microphone on here and uh, trying to get my presentation up. And um, let me do that, or let me share the screen. Uh, there we go. I believe this should do it. Can you see my screen? Yes. We've Excellent. Got We've got your uh, whole screen. Pardon, pardon me? We've got your whole screen, so we don't have the slide occupying the whole screen. At okay. least that's what it is. Let me... Uh... Let me try this again. I think you just click on slideshow, Matt, bottom right. I did that. Yeah, it's coming. There you, yeah, there you go, Matt. Okay, I was going to say it's coming up on a, a, a different screen. And so Matt, I've been let, this... Matt, let me just interject. If people have questions, uh, please feel free to put them in the Q&A. Excellent. Um, as introduced, I'm Matt Zadar, Water Resource Manager in San Joaquin County. I've been doing this for 35 years. And uh, like they say, even a blind pig finds an acorn. And I've picked up a few acorns in my basket. And the joy of spreading them around is really fun for me these days in terms of mentoring and coaching, counseling, and doing the kind of social engineering we need to do to, to, to move the ball down the field on all of this. I really wanted to, you know, back up what the opportunities have been painted so well by both Julie and Kamiar and Ajay. And uh, I guess I get to be in the role somewhat of the grumpy old man on the ground here about some of the constraints we are up against and encouraging everybody that is in leadership roles to think about how we remove those constraints so we can realize the opportunities presented. We hit on this integrated planning and project development. It's critical. The whole idea of multi, multi, multi. I'm, gonna, I'm beginning with the major messages, and then uh, we'll back them up throughout the presentation. And there really is nothing new under the sun. Uh, and I say, well, maybe some things, especially in the area of technology. But spreading of floodwaters, uh, getting it in the ground, uh, practicing flood irrigation, so, many of the, so much of the stuff has been around. But now we're, we're in the opportunity mode where, where things are just really timely. And there's so much positive going on with, with the state integrating the, the, the um, state water plan, the Central Valley Flood Protection Plan, the resiliency portfolio, all the things. There's a confluence of circumstances, and I think our, our time is now to really make some things happen. Um, I want to emphasize the importance of communications, engagement, and outreach. Fund it and do it. It's usually one of the things that get uh, minimized, but we really got uh, a responsibility to educate and inform. Uh, I, I say around here, it's kind of become my mantra, local control really means local funding. And DDBAR has been great, as have the taxpayers that have funded bonds that really got us going with developing groundwater sustainability plans, those GSPs that guide how we manage groundwater for the long term under the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act. Um, and I want to focus a little bit and discuss some regulatory reform and, and legislation that, that may likely be needed to uh, make things move. I always use this simple planning construct. What water, uh, through what diversion and conveyance, to what lands for recharge and what type of recharge, whether that's direct in lieu or the flood mark types of things we've talked about. On that water available for recharge, you know, the first thing you do is say, what water is available for recharge? These flood peaks, how much is there? How can we move the water around? And I, I also say WAA, that's the, the water availability analysis. And that's the requirement of the state board uh, to specifically provide information to back up any filing. So we're here and on the McQuallamy River, we have a filing, a water rights filing application since 1990 that we're working to ripen into a permit. And one of the things state board needs is this water availability analysis. And then they act as a responsible agency pursuant to CEQA to make their determinations to ripen that permit. Putting these floodwaters to use, you got to know what's what's out there and 
and possibly who owns it, how it impacts existing users, or all of the, the natural resources and, and uh, riparian habitats and fish flows and all of those things. So what water, what diversion and conveyance, what lands for what type of recharge. I coordinate the San Joaquin Groundwater Authority. It's a joint powers authority of 16 groundwater sustainability agencies. We have produced one groundwater sustainability plan. We are one of the critically overdrafted basins. Um, our first cut at the GSP was found uh, incomplete and then we responded to DWR. We're anxiously awaiting to hear whether we're complete or not because we're, we're two years from a, away from having to update the whole plan. The assets we really have in play, and I emphasize the assets, are the McQualamy, the Calaveras River, and Stanislaus. And again, thank you to DWR on this Calaveras River watershed study, really looking at things from top to bottom with the models and then climate change. And where we're really trying to engage the local community here is on what are those adapted management strategies, including use of natural infrastructure, as Julie painted out those opportunities, so that we can take maximum advantage of our other big asset. We got 1.5 to 2 million acre feet of available groundwater storage under our feet here. That's a pretty big reservoir uh, that can be managed conjun through conjunctive use, combined use of both surface water supplies and storage. Uh, for the benefits of the, of the people here, but also interregionally and possibly even uh, throughout the state. That storage is really an asset. And we have a lot of open space, alluvial fans, floodplains, appropriate soils and things that will help us get that water in the ground. Um, the question is, is the aquifer half full or, or half empty? Are you kind of an optimist or a pessimist? And how do we move people from pessimism to optimism? Integrated planning, I won't beat on this, multiple partners, multi-objective, multi-benefits, multi-funding, and multi-sources of water. That's that conjunctive use concept of managed surface and groundwater storage. And I really do believe, and my, my background and degree was in watershed sciences. So thinking from the, the top of the mountains all the way down to the bottom of the aquifer to get the most and provide the greatest benefits both to people and our habitats and wildlife. Um, I always say what our role is, is in decision support. And I like to emphasize that we try to bring the best available engineering, economic and fiscal environment into that decision space and, and really try to inform uh, our board of supervisors, the city councils, our groundwater authority. This is complicated stuff. Uh, and you have to re reduce it down to digestible portions. And, you know, we can get wrapped up in the acronym soup of Sigma and CEQA and WAAs and all of that. So it is a challenge to bring people the right information at the right time so they can make timely decisions, commit resources, whether that's water or people or, or whatever. Um, when I say there was nothing new under the sun, but things just become timely. And, and my exception was technology because of the benefits of improved forecasting. We can do things like forecast coordinated operations and the flood forecast informed reservoir operations. Um, and those key concepts Kamiar brought out, and I thought explained really well, that we say the FIRO and the FLOODMAR are really fraternal twins and we've kind of kept, and I know DWR brought this together too, the whole idea of FIRO-MAR. Um, and success is about timing, understanding, and, and alignment. When it, when it comes to reservoir operations, it's kind of tough to explain to a lot of people. You have rule curves that say, okay, we have to leave storage space depending on the season for our water supply pool and for the flood pool. Now what the forecast informed reservoir operation does is says, hey, if we know so much better what's coming our way, whether it's snow melt or rainfall, we need to be looking at this space, you know, called the bureau space. And if you look at uh, historical operations in the brown, you know, it, it said when you encroach in that flood pool in those wet months, you got to stay right on that line at the, the boundary between the flood pool and the conservation pool and then water would get be released without FIRO. Now with FIRO, you can encroach more into the flood pool beyond the rules. And the Corps of Engineers is really looking at this and updating the water control manual that creates these curves on a number of reservoirs. But you can actually capture more storage. And, and uh, Kamiar talked about those yield and the, the tangible measurable benefits coming from that. There is this idea, and this is the hard one to sell, because if you know you've got good forecasts and you got this kind of hydrograph coming, the opportunity comes from saying, okay, I want to dump water, 
but you're dumping somebody's water when you come below that flood space and starting dumping water from your water supply pool. That, that's what gets general managers, water agencies fired, that kind of thing. But if you really can keep your name on those drops stored in groundwater and it is still your extractable asset in storage, then we could keep your names painted on those drops, dump water below the rule curve and know that we're going to be able to refill the reservoirs. So that that's kind of the opportunity, but it's going to take some convincing and good data and a lot of communications to uh, get people to do that on that subject, communications, engagement, and outreaching. You know, there, I don't know that there's too much. Um, and if we've been short or subject, I and mean, we have been subject to some criticism about how transparent, how well we've communicated, engaged the community, and, and brought people in. And I, I think we've done a reasonable job. But really think about your messaging to connect the dots. And, and our, we're putting together a, a strategy with a bunch of our partners here to talk about droughts during flood and floods during drought. Um, you need to do that if you're going to really realize the opportunities that, that come. And we're saying drought is not an appropriate subject for emergency response. We've been asking people to conserve for years, and we get into a drought situation, and then we want them to cut back more. We're really trying to rebrand and recraft that message to say we need to take that long-term view and vision and, and figure out how we manage the floods for those drought years so we build a resilient long-term sustainable water supply that preserves a quality of life when we hit a drought and the local economies. That, that's the major message we're trying to package and, and rebrand. And I, I jokingly say, let no crisis go unleveraged. The drought provides opportunity to educate. The most recent floodwaters provide a great opportunity to educate and how we message on that crossover. And I say we, the royal we, are all responsible for importing and educating. That's that's both ourselves and and our public. So we're trying to come up and we're working on our, our GWA, our communications and engagement plan. We're updating that for the next two years when we have to update the plan. So we're doing righteous. But again, with 16 GSAs and those GSAs have their own great base and their own consumers, um, the we is really all of us. Uh, and we try, we're trying to put materials together so that they can distribute it to the rest of the board members that aren't on the joint powers authority and get it the message to the public and doing this well is isn't cheap really uh and it's usually the first function to be to be cut but i think it shouldn't be neglected and i would encourage all of you in leadership roles to be able to make the communications and engagement happen and i said that local control means local funding you know and to some degree i guess you have to play the fear card and say state intervention is a real deal um, and litigation adjudication are really no better. That's all very expensive, time-consuming propositions. Sigma gave us the opportunity to really say, let's do local control. But again, local control implies local funding. That's one of the biggest constraints to success is with Proposition 218 and 26. It is so hard to, to get resources. And again, these board members don't get elected by saying, I'm going to raise your pumping fees or your land-based assessments. Uh, you know, that it's just not a, necessarily a popular position. But we're really going to have to take some hard looks at uh, how we get things funded. And we come up with our local matches for when the state and federal largesse is available to us. Um, I always say, do you all agree on what the problem is, is the first step in planning? And is there any ownership of that problem? Uh, if you own the problem, then you're going to be committed and maybe get some skin in the game um, and really defining in a hard way, asking hard question on who's contributing to the problem of overdraft here and, and in what proportion. And we're working hard to develop a water accounting framework that would be tied to a funding and financing strategy that says, OK, we got to create accountability, ownership of the problem, and then have people willing and ready and able to uh, to assess themselves because it is capital uh intensive to stuff for new conveyance uh accessing easements and rights of way all the stuff that it takes to really take what water is available and move it divert it and store it the economics of it gets complicated and you got to do that too it's to quantify the benefits and i always talk about willingness and ability to pay no one no one really wants to pay more but you have to really convince them what those benefits are both those say natural infrastructure benefits but also the yields and, and, and water supply benefits 
Um, 218 is a big constraint, as is the anti-tax, anti-government sentiment. Kamiar mentioned the regulatory reform and relief. Obviously, sequent permitting relief uh, is necessary. And thanks, DWR, for really coordinating with the state board and trying to make that executive order work. Um, but really, that needs to be manifest in legislation. Um, we need to see groundwater as a designated beneficial use. And importantly, we need to talk about the, the some of the distinctions that are made between extractive and non-extractive uses. Um, the public benefit comes from the non-extractive uses, looking at the, the habitat values, surface and groundwater interject, interactions that preserve those and how we protect groundwater dependent ecosystems, all really important, all considered non-extractive benefits, which means when you put the water in the ground, you would not maybe have the opportunity to extract that water. But that stored water needs to be viewed as an asset because there's such difference in price points between wet year and dry year supplies. And if we're going to keep ag productive and ag rates down, we have to find those ag and urban partnerships under that multi, multi, multi sponsor and multi benefit. <laughs> um, excuse me. Um, this is my, I'm, I'm heading towards my conclusion that groundwater is really a 12 step. Uh, program. First, we admit we were powerless and needed this Sustainable Groundwater Management Act legislation. And I, I'm stealing this from a brilliant woman named Maureen Stapleton. I saw her do this presentation 15 years ago, pre-Sigma, so I'm kind of updating and adapting. And we came to believe under step two that a power greater than ourselves could restore sanity, whether that's DWR, the state board, or the courts. And we made a decision to turn our will over and lives over to the care of your local GSAs who are the ones that have the statutory power and authority to really make things happen, both in terms of funding and setting the priorities and adopting these um, GSPs that have program management actions and set measurable, sustainable management criteria that, that you have to achieve uh, in this 40 year planning horizon. We made a searching and fearless moral inventory. What we did was develop a water budget and quantify the problem. And again, the purpose was to try to get ownership and distribute, uh, say blame, around, but also think about a water accounting flame that would allow us to take credit for the ex potentially stored water and the extractive uses that would give us price points that would keep uh, water rates down and really help, say, between that ag and urban partnership or public and private. We have to incentivize those investments. Admitted to ourselves under step five in the community, the ex nature of our wrong. And, you know, you do that through the community outreach engagement and setting those sustainable management uh, criteria and developing the water accounting framework to hold ourselves accountable. Number six, we're entirely ready to remove all those defects of character. We, we opted, are opting to do 218 in assessments, which is challenging. Uh, humbly asked a higher power to remove our shortcomings, but we obtained grant funding, a lot of it from DWR, because uh, we haven't been able to raise those monies. And if we're really going to be serious about it, we're going to go to the public, which really is our higher authority, and get them to vote affirmative for 218. Under the eighth, made a list of our persons we have harmed, uh, doing hardcore economic analysis, say, where are those economic impacts and benefits, uh, and doing the right fiscal analysis. Who, who, who could be harmed by some of the investments that our disadvantaged communities are key? We have to support those. And that really goes right to the made direct amends to such people wherever possible, whether that's through well mitigation, programs or uh, finding ways to support the disadvantaged communities that are impacted by both supply and water quality issues and continue to take a personal inventory. We became willing to pay and we personally, as leaders and champions, supported and promoted your 218 initiative locally. And then we saw it through meditation to improve our conscious contact with DWR and the state board in this case, because they still are a higher power and a threat and both the a resource and, and DWR has, is doing such a good job of helping people through the facilitation support services, doing the AEM, doing the technical services and support. We hold ourselves accountable under the statute to produce annual reports every year, say, are we making progress through those measurable objectives in the sustainable management criteria and doing our five year updates and uh, really getting your 218 initiative passed? And finally, having a spiritual awakening and being so informed after presentations like this, we try to carry this message to others and to practice these principles in all our affairs. 
Uh, therefore, I attend these and present at uh, PCL type of events, and I'll put in my plug for the Groundwater Resource Association here, as I've been a member for a long time, and uh, they're doing a great job of helping to provide resources to educate and reform. And with that, I'll turn it back over to Roger and say thank you all for, for hearing the grumpy old man out today, and I appreciate the opportunities and uh, your help and support in overcoming some of these constraints. Well, thank you, Matt. Uh, uh, you know, my reaction is uh, there, are, there are a lot of us who are still working through the 12 steps <laughs> and haven't quite gotten to 12 yet. Uh, <laughs> but at least, uh, at, at least that's a, a very informative uh, pathway to, um, <laughs> to take. Uh, and I want to, uh, beyond thanking you, um, thank our, the other presenters very much as as well, uh, you know, I would I have to to apologize, uh, Jai. I was so uh, focused on Kamyar's last name that that I got your first name wrong. So I <laughs> oh no, it's okay. Thank you. <laughs> try to try to make up for, up for that. So um, uh, we have uh, a little bit of time for for questions and uh, just to uh, kick it off. And I and by the way, I want to mention to those listening in that the um, questions will be we it will be posted on the PCL uh, website in conjunction with the, the programs and so um, for questions we don't get to the and answers uh, you, you uh, can subsequent to to this presentation go there and and find them uh, or uh, if um, you don't hear a question uh, that you think we got asked to uh, go take take a look there because uh, with the time available, I don't think we'll get we'll get to all of them. You know what what strikes me, and I want to um, put this to to all the panelists uh, is this uh, rather dynamic tension that we experience in California, but between flood and drought, uh, and uh, on the. The, the flood side, uh, it's somewhat uh, top of mind uh, at the at the moment, given the storms that we recently uh, experienced. But drought is also uh, top of mind, given what we've been going through in the last several years and continue to uh, experience. So, uh, for each of you, uh, what is what do you see as the the connection between? what we are trying to do to address uh, flood and what we're trying to do to address drought conditions on an ongoing basis. Some of you got to this to a certain extent in your, in your presentations, but, but what else do we, we need to be thinking about on a long-term basis that helps us manage both of those circumstances that we're going to face for, the, for as long as we can foresee? Anybody want to jump in on that? I, I, I'll raise my hand there. I, I, I think really the key is conjunctive use and understanding that we have to take advantage of the wet years to get through the dry years. And we have to take advantage of both surface water storage behind reservoirs, and we have to leverage our snowpack. We have to think about revising the reservoir operations and the water control manuals to take advantage of those assets. And we have to consider the, the, the natural infrastructure. It's so key. And use of the natural infrastructure should be just part of your project definition and design, and not something you pick up at the back end of the CEQA process where it's mitigation uh, requirements or monitoring. Um, so I, I think all the high points were hit here about storage, wet year, dry year, and, and the connection to, to get through droughts so it's not an impact to quality of life of the economy. Roger, this come yard. You know, I, I totally agree with uh, what Matt said. And I, you know, more and more, I think this is as much or more about uh, institutions and past practice as it is about science and engineering. Um, I think we have to get past thinking of droughts and floods as a, a short term, once in a while uh, emergency event that we have to to respond to and rather moving forward plan and and prepare for high <laughs> flow events and low or non-flow events uh together and do it in a way 
uh, where we actually uh, leverage opportunities that one event provides uh, or one condition provides the other condition. Uh, so uh, rather than, and I think our institutions, uh, organizations, you know, we, we have our flood managers, we have our water supply managers, our water quality managers, our ecosystem managers, and uh, we really need to co-manage at a watershed scale. One more little note on that. We cannot manage and design based on average. The, the, the nature of California is wet and dry cycles. And that's what you have to, to plan for. I mean, a lot of times, a average means nothing here. It does not. It's, it's really what's happening in the extremes and, and something less than the extremes. That's yeah, the basic that, design. I think that, that's a great, a great point, Matt. Um, uh, we have a question. Uh, to what extent do land use planning decisions conflict with <coughs> infrastructure and does the state need to provide objective standards to provide natural infrastructure potential. Any any thoughts among the panelists on that question? Uh, yes and yes. Uh, <laughs> again, our our land use decisions and planning is is done by counties and cities. Our water planning is done by water agencies and flood agencies, um, and our ecosystem planning in large part is done by NGOs and. Uh, they historically have not planned together uh, enough. And so I think uh, if we're now rethinking how repurposing land use and doing it in a way that can help uh, recharge and aquifer replenishment and flood attenuation mm -hmm. and drought preparedness, um, the land use decisions are going to have to be uh, part and parcel of that decision making. Just to follow up on, on that, come here. It, do we, um, uh, I mean, each of you have made certain recommendations as part of your presentations, which are greatly appreciated. Do we need to be doing something at the, at the state level to give further direction to local governments to uh, foster that kind of uh, coordination that, that you just described? Well, the general plan guidelines that are put together by the Office of Planning and Research, OPR, uh, does have the option of having a water element. And in the past, uh, there has been some guidance there. Uh, I think we've learned a lot more about what needs to be done and what potentials are. And I think just uh, beefing up and uh, you know, updating that water element to give um, land use planners uh, more information uh, in, as they put their general plans together. But there, there was this concept of, of paper water for a long time out there. And Cortese Hertzberg Knox tried to knock the, a bit of the nonsense out of that because it was like, build it and then we'll go find the supply. And, and you can't just say, oh, we've got paper water, but it is still extremely challenging even to, to interpret existing state law and requirements that say you have to have proof of a long-term assured water supply. I don't know how you do that in these critically overdrafted basins where most of your municipal areas like ours are almost 100% dependent on groundwater. You're up against it. And so you got to play some pretty uh, unique and interesting policy games uh, to, to swim through those shoals. It, it's really tough. But Sigma also says you got to look at land use and try to bring them together. So the structure is out there, whether it's truly being applied or if there's a need to strengthen some of that. Um, Sigma and the, the groundwater sustainability plans, along with urban water management plans or conservation plans and ag water conservation plans, where you really have to admit painfully in that 12 step ladder that you have some ownership of the problem and need to invest in the solutions. Um, because we have challenges, compliance with laws as they exist now, or lack of enforcement of some of those as they exist now, and we result in lots of case law that uh, try to set precedents once you get to Apple and Supreme Court levels on how land use and water supply should be brought together. But from a planning standpoint, we use the general plan to forecast what's our ultimate level of demand, and that's what we're shooting for to, to comply uh, with our with our Sigma documents and our GSP to say we have that supply that'll get us through drought and take advantage of the wet years. 
Yeah, I think that's a great point. And, and uh, Julie, just uh, on this on this point, given your work on the ground and uh, trying to expand and apply uh, groundwater recharge and multi-benefit habitat restoration, flood management, and the like, do you have some insight on the extent to which uh, you your and your work with local governments? Uh, there are things that should or could or need to be done. Um, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. I mean, huh. I'm, I'm standing on the ground where you work in, you know, appraisals and you work in um, a, a tax base and um, almost all of the work that we do to try to reconnect uh, river overbank flows to the river's historic floodplain um, it, it represents a loss of value a loss of value in tax base, a loss of value to the land itself. It's it's deficit, uh, you know, just uh, value. And that seems absurd to me considering the public value associated with these actions that are being taken. So um, to the extent that land use decisions at the local level can, and I think there's hope on the horizon. I think in the next 10 years, we'll start to see some creative um implications from Sigma planning in this, right? Putting higher values on those floodplain areas and the potential for them to um, overbank and contribute to the water balance in a watershed. Um, but where we're sitting right now is a really strange transition where <laughs> the our human societal values of the past are driving, um, you know, especially with regards to land use, are driving a disincentive um, to rewet the landscape. So we're, we're in a transition. Well, yes, um, you, we, you know, right. I mean, I, I'm, I'm sorry, we're we're running up against the clock. Um, we have a number of uh, good questions that we haven't been able to get to, and I'm sorry uh, for that. But again, look at the look at the website. I think Howard afterwards, and people can see the questions and the and the answers. Uh, and so, uh, thank you again to our panelists. Great presentation, a lot to chew on, and a lot of work to be done. Uh, and so, Howard, with with that, let me hand it back to you. Thanks so much, Roger. I really appreciate it. Thanks uh, to the panelists. Uh, what a great discussion. Um, a lot of great technical information there. So really appreciate everyone's time today. Roger for moderating the panel as well. I also wanted to give a shout out to uh, Judy Corbett uh, as a PCL board member uh, for putting this panel together. I think she was the one that uh, drafted most of you. So uh, thanks for agreeing. Thanks everyone for joining us on our first session this morning. Uh,